Is there any significance to the clay that Jesus spit on to heal the blind man? He had just left the temple on a Sabbath when he healed the man. So being in Jerusalem, he was on God's turf, his portion on Jacob. Was this Mm -hmm. another message slight to the powers and principalities of a heavenly spiritual nature that they got and we didn't? I understand that Jesus used spit other times to heal people, and I understand the Levitical law about spit, but do you know if there is any deeper meaning to the fact he used the dirt clay of Jerusalem to mix with his spit to perform the healing. Mm-hmm. Well, if, if there is, it would be pretty oblique. And and you'll understand that by the time I get to the end of the answer. On the one hand, I don't think there's anything clearly going on here with cosmic geography because there's no indication that the blindness was caused by the powers of darkness. If you had that element in there, then I could see, again, some sort of cosmic geographical sign or confrontation here, but but we don't have that. Again, the Old Testament comments about saliva. In, in the Old Testament, uh, it could saliva could convey ritual uncleanness if the person spitting had been unclean. If they were in an unclean status, that person's spit would render, in theory, someone else uh, unclean. So the verse for that is Leviticus 15.8, for example. If the one with the discharge spits on someone who is clean, then he shall wash his clothes and bathe himself, so on and so forth. So uh, it it could render someone unclean. That's interesting because the the unclean status typically takes the discussion into – let me rephrase that, put it this way. Some scholars see a parallel to this. and It's going to sound odd, but they see a parallel to this with when Jesus uh, heals the leper. You recall leprosy, obviously, you you can't touch a a leper because then you become unclean. And so when Jesus does this, he's asked by the leper, if if you will, you can heal me. And Jesus says, yes, I'm willing to do that. And he touches the leper and heals him. So on on the one hand, when Jesus does does this, it kind of renders the uncleanness point moot because as soon as he touches the guy, he's healed. So he's not really, is he really in contact with an unclean person or not? He looks clean to me. So some people think that that because spit is referenced in Leviticus as possibly rendering someone unclean, that when Jesus used it, the teaching point of both that and the leper is really the same. In other words, that that Jesus is a higher authority than the normal priests, you know, who would be using Mosaic law to determine whether you should or shouldn't do something like that. So by using saliva to cure the man or by touching the leper. Jesus is presented or is presenting himself as someone having some sort of unusual or inordinate spiritual authority, because it basically it amounts to Jesus saying, look, I'm unaffected by these Levitical taboos. I transcend them and, 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 and watch because I'm going to do this act. And, and sort of the question becomes moot because this person is healed now. Now, that, that's possible. Again, s- scholars go there because they're looking for a parallel to the, this unusual incident with the using of the spit. Then they find Leviticus 15, and then they start thinking, well, maybe this is kind of like the leprosy incident. It's possible. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's that strong of a connection, but it, I think it's on the table. Saliva, of course, was regarded by some rabbis as having healing properties. In other words, if The spit of a person who wasn't unclean is a different matter. And you can actually find in rabbinic tradition references to saliva being an an agent of healing. I'm just going to give the abbreviation, uh, BAT-126B. I can't remember what, what that stands for in the Talmud, but it says this, the saliva of the firstborn of a father heals specifically diseases of the eye, but the saliva of the firstborn of the mother does not heal. Again, it's just a rabbinic opinion, but it shows, you know, that 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 some at least some Jews were thinking that okay, there had it had healing properties. Now, the interesting part of this is that it's the firstborn of a father, and so is Jesus doing this because of this Jewish notion that the firstborn, in his case, of the father, which of course he has claimed for himself, is a healer, which of course would be associated with the Messiah, and so does this act. So kind of reinforce his messianic status and his claim to be the son of God. Okay. Again, I think that's on the table. I think it's possible. On the other hand, you'll get other rabbis that condemned saliva because pagans often, you know, use saliva in their healing rituals. And so some of the rabbis were skittish over it. Rabbi Akiba has a, a famous sentence about this, that we shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. So 
you know, who really knows? Now, I, I think there's a more interesting parallel, more interesting sort of backdrop to this, other than this, these set of possibilities. There was a recent article, this is 2013, so it's, it's just in the last couple of years, in Journal of Biblical Literature, where somebody, the, the author, happened to notice that there, this spit language is actually in a few Dead Sea Scroll texts. And the article, if, if you know, I, I can't, again, it's not something I can post because it's not public domain. But the article essentially, uh, I'll just give you the, the, the gist of it. There's a, there was an old interpretation of this passage, John 9 with the, the spit from uh, Irenaeus, our, our, our buddy Irenaeus. And like I said, I, I like him because he thinks outside the box a lot. But Irenaeus taught that Jesus' use of clay, the, the spit, you know, that, to form the clay, to heal the man born blind alluded to God's use of dust or dirt in the creation account in Genesis 2, you know, where he creates Adam from the dust of the ground. Now, that, there are a lot of scholars who didn't buy that because, hey, it's, it's dust. It's not, it's not clay. You know, and it, it just didn't feel right. Well, this article actually defends the idea using the Dead Sea Scrolls. So Irenaeus gets defended here. And what it amounts to, I'll, I'll just quote a few excerpts from, from the article. Uh, it both spittle and clay are similarly juxtaposed in several Dead Sea Scrolls in the context of the creation of humankind, suggesting that John and the authors of these scrolls may have been drawing on a shared tradition that understood both elements as materials of creation. Now, it's important to keep in mind, this is me talking now, that ancient Near Eastern you know, creation stories and myths also use spit and dirt and things like this. So it, it well, when you go back into the Israelite context, these elements are part of the story. And the, the main reason, back to the article here now, this is another quotation, the chief reason scholars have been hesitant to see an allusion to Genesis in John 9, 6, you know, Jesus' act of spitting and creating the clay, is that whereas it is dust, Hebrew, the Hebrew term there is afar, out of which God creates Adam in Genesis 2 7. Jesus uses clay, which is a different Hebrew term, kemar. Now, what's interesting here is dust gets translated in, in Greek in Septuagint and New Testament as kous, the word is kous, and mud, the clay, is palos. Palos is also used by the Septuagint in the Old Testament passages where God is described as a potter. Remember the potter and the clay thing? The Old Testament casting God as the, as the potter you know, who molds the clay. And, and that's associated in certain contexts, certain instances when this language is used with creation. So you actually do have Old Testament precedent for clay talk in terms of, you know, with respect to the creation account and not just dust talk is what this amounts to. Now, the two Dead Sea Scrolls of the article, well, it actually refers to more than this, but I'll give you I'll give you two examples of what this author uh, is trying, you know, basically how he's defending Irenaeus and defending this view from the Dead Sea Scrolls. One of them is the rule of the community, which is one QS for you Qumran uh, fans out there. This would be column eleven, lines twenty one and twenty two says, "As what shall one born of a woman be considered in your presence?" Question: Shaped from dust has he been? Okay, so one born from a woman, which is human, humankind, you know, as, as what shall humankind be considered in your presence? Shaped from dust has he been. Maggot's food shall be his dwelling. He is spat saliva, molded clay, and for dust is his longing. What will, uh, what will the clay reply and the one shaped by hand? And what advice will he be able to understand? So it's a clear reference to humanity being formed not just from the dust of the ground, but spit and clay right here in this in this scroll text. Another example is, comes from the Thanksgiving hymns. That's 1QH, uh, specifically in this instance, 1QHA, column 20, says, What is he to do that he who returns to his dust? I have kept my silence, for what can I say about this matter? In accordance with my knowledge... I spoke, spat saliva, one fashion from clay. Again, it, it's kind of an, an awkward translation or an awkward text, but it's another clear reference to the one returning to the dust, which would be humankind. And at the end of the line, 
that that humanity is identified with spat saliva and being fashioned from clay. So if this is the backdrop, and again, this is Second Temple material, if this is the backdrop to John 9, and I actually think there's a better chance of this being the backdrop than the rabbinic material, frankly, because the rabbinic material is later. It might refer to some attitude during Jesus' time, it, it may or may not. We we can't really be sure. But with Second Temple material, we you know we we can be sure of of the greater potential. There's a greater potential for cross fertilization here. But if this is the backdrop, this idea of associating the spit and the and the and the dirt forming clay, and it, it's an allusion to creation. That's really interesting because then this whole incident in John nine would be casting Jesus as at least having power over the physical world as the creator did, or even as the creator. In other words, it casts Jesus, it puts Jesus, pardon the pun, in that mold so that when people would read this or hear the story or witness it, their mind would be taken back to something that the potter did, the creator did. And here you have Jesus doing it. So it's a way to telegraph. And John is, is really, you know, well known again, for connecting Jesus to Old Testament, to, to Yahweh of the Old Testament. He, it, John is very well known, the gospel, again, for really strong statements of deity. And so this, I think, could be added to the list based on the association with the creator, with the potter uh, who, who uh, molds the clay. 